See 
worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God and maker. Can we just sing that chorus one more time? God is so good, and his presence is so sweet. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Mm, my goodness, my God. What a God we serve. Hallelujah. Welcome, everybody. Thursday night, and we are glad to be here. We welcome uh, all of you that are watching on, on live stream. Welcome, family. Hallelujah. So we're going to take an opportunity to sow into his kingdom. It is so much fun, and it's such an honor to sow, isn't it? It's great. So, Father, we just thank you for the seed we're about to receive right now. We thank you. Um, we sow it in faith. We sow it believing, Lord, that we receive. We sow into you. You so love that you gave your only, so we so love that we give our only today. We give you us and, and our resources for living here in Jesus' name. And we give you praise and glory for it now in the name of Jesus. And the saints said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Richard. Oh. If I can get you to stand on your feet, please. Hallelujah. I want to take a moment to, uh, um, yesterday was Pastor Jackie's birthday. <laughs> yes, happy birthday. And so we want to take a, uh, just take a, uh, and give her another hand clap as she comes to the platform, will you? Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Woohoo! Thank you, Mike. Happy birthday, happy birthday. How's that? We good? Yeah, praise God. I went down when I should have gone up. Glory to God. God is so good. He's so sweet in here tonight. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, God. Glory to you, God. Oh, praise you, Father. It's good to be back. Good to be in God's house again. Woohoo! It is such a privilege. Um, you know, it's so funny, Pastor Carlo, that you picked that song. Come let us worship and bow down. Because it's an old song. It's not, 
it's not a current song. And I, and I, I, I bowed down because, I, not because the song says to, because I was really worshiping God and loving on God. is so good and tonight is all about leading with love so it doesn't surprise me God will play that song Thank you, sweetie. it's really not a sappy message <laughs> but it's just God has just been showing himself over and over and over is so overwhelming. Sorry, I don't usually wear mascara. Now I'm going to be all smudged. <laughs> Praise you, God. What the Holy Spirit reminded me of, because I'm here to talk about the Alpha Conference and the amazing things that God has done, but I forgot, because see, God doesn't forget anything. God doesn't forget a seed sown. God doesn't forget an act of kindness. God doesn't forget an act of obedience. And so what he reminded me when Pastor Carlo played that song is because I, I so enjoyed that song. And so I was praising God, and I was really enjoying it and coming into the presence of God, and I realized, I thought, when did I hear that song first? And it was 20 years ago. And 20 years ago... I got born again. And 20 years ago, and two or three months later, I was leading Alpha. God is so good. 20 years. God doesn't forget a thing. God doesn't forget what you do. God does, he doesn't forget your sacrifices. God doesn't forget when you're up in the middle of the night praying, when you're fighting a battle, when you're trying to get to the other side. God is so good and gracious that 20 years ago, when this newborn baby Christian, <laughs> who knew a lot less about anything other than she loved Jesus, that's all I knew. That's all I was equipped with. And a crazy priest thought it was a good idea for me to start Alpha in the Catholic Church in Nova Scotia. I was such a baby. I didn't even know how to read my Bible. And I share that because God will use anyone. Not because I, I was not perfect. I'm not perfect now. I was certainly not perfect. I, I had more flesh than spirit. I had, but I loved Jesus. And that was the only active ingredient that God needed, was a heart that would be submitted to him. And so it's really neat that Darren and I would get the opportunity to go to the Alpha Conference in London. It never even occurred to me. It was 20 years later. I never even thought about that till that's why I'm all, anyway, whew, praise God. The conference in London was two days and that we talked a tiny bit about it last night in Alpha because Alpha's schedule is pretty tight and we want to make sure we have lots of time for group discussion. It was May 1st and 2nd and it was held at um, the uh, Royal Albert Hall in London and you know one of the things I shared last night because we were encouraging people to come to the Alpha uh, weekend which is next weekend and you know as I was thinking about what I was going to say on Wednesday night to the Alpha group to really encourage them um, was that I thought, well, God, how do you want me to position this? And I was thinking about the Alpha Conference I had been to in London, and the Holy Spirit really said to me, how much can a life be transformed in two days? And I thought back on the conference, and I thought, an amazing amount in two days. And that's what I shared um, last night at Alpha, is if you'll give God your time, he can completely transform your life. You know, and that's a big part of what the Alpha Weekend is about. That's what this conference was about. Um, 
the theme of the conference was leading in love. And Pastor Paul, the offering you took up tonight, you focused on love. Like, that's the whole thing. And anyway, so it was at the Royal Albert Hall. There were 6,000 people in attendance from all over the world. They had the headsets on because they had to have translation so they could understand what was being said uh, throughout the conference. Peter, I don't know if the pictures are going to work. If you can try to bring up the first picture. Royal Albert Hall in London, if you're not familiar with London, is... Uh, it's not a massive venue, like it seats about six, 7,000 people, but it's where all the acts, where anybody is anybody, that's where they either start out or that's where they go. Um, so the first, you can see, um, so it's circular in nature. The acoustics are amazing. Um, and it was filled with people from all over the world. And, and God just does amazing things. Like you could sit wherever you wanted to sit at whatever level you had bought tickets for. So what are the odds in 6,000 people that a bunch of Nova Scotians would sit behind us? Like a group from Sackville, from the Catholic Church in Sackville, were sitting directly behind us. There's 6,000 people there, you know? And so there was, along the whole trip, because after this we went and did some vacation, every part of the trip, there was not a day where God's hand was not made evident, where the Holy Spirit didn't bring something that was so precious throughout the whole trip. So... There were nine main sessions and 12 breakout sessions that you could choose from. So the main sessions were all held in Royal Albert, Albert Hall. For those that have done Alpha, the breakouts were in Holy Trinity Brompton, Holy Trinity, I think it's Leicester Square, and another Holy Trinity spot. So the church has three campuses. Um, the sessions were all excellent. They were all very, very good. They were very different in nature in some of them. But what was common throughout them was the presence of the Holy Spirit. You could really feel God moving in and through the sessions. Um, for me, I found I received correction, inspiration, direction, and encouragement. And a little bit of some of each, depending on, <laughs> on what session you were at. Nikki Gumbel, uh, who was anybody we, has done Alpha, we all know Nikki, we all know and love Nikki. So he was the kind of the facilitator and, and keynote speaker for pieces of it. Um, if we can turn in our Bibles, please, to 1 John 4.19. And so this is what Nikki really focused on was 1 John 4, 19. And it says, we love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. And so a lot of the conversation was about, you're, we're not defined by your job or your title. We should be defining ourselves as someone radically loved by God. That's who we are. Where we work, what we wear, what our hair looks like, it really doesn't matter. What matters is that we are defiantly, radically loved by God, and what are we worth to God? And Pastor Gary's taught on this many, many times. We're worth the life of Jesus. We're, li we're worth the, the sacrifice of another. So what Nikki tied in was how God really leads us with love. And he really emphasized, because this was an Alpha Leadership Conference, and what I picked up, what was obvious very quickly at the beginning of the conference, in the choice of the praise and worship, in the choice of the speakers, in the choice of what was being said, is that there was a unity in the body, and there was also um, a sense of urgency about the time that we are in. You could absolutely sense that everybody was perceiving that we are in that last hour that last part of time, that time to, to, to finish the harvesting of this planet. So, so Nikki taught a lot on God leads us with love, and love is where leadership begins. The first job of leaders is to love, and love and leadership go hand in hand. And, and so it's interesting how it all tied together. We talked about that love is the number one char characteristic of leadership, um, not just in the church, but every form of leadership. And he said, it's not enough to love preaching. You must love the people you're preaching to. Yeah. 
which is what Pastor Gary does. We see that in our church. This is a lot of this, Pastor Gary, I was like, Pastor Gary says that, Pastor Gary says this. Yeah, I heard Pastor, like it was just so, there was so much confirmation. Um, Jesus walked in love and is our role model. This is what Nikki was teaching on. Apart from Jesus, there are no perfect leaders, but God will always help us through the Holy Spirit. And so if we turn to Galatians 5, please. And we're going to go to 22 and 23. Peter, can I have that up in the Amplified, please? Thank you. So Galatians 5, 22, 23 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And it says that the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which his presence within accomplishes. That's so important. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is within us when we got born again. Now we, we have to yield to it. We have to discipline our flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one that is working within us to accomplish the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, and even temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, benevolence, faithfulness, and 23, please, gentleness, meekness, humility, self-control, self-restraint. Uh, against such, there is no law that can bring a charge. And so what was really, what really wove through a lot of the, the conference was the leaders that were chosen to speak uh, the one leader that I'll talk about, he so reminded me of, of George Moss. He oozed the love of God. He, he, just, he just oozed it. You could just, uh, you could just sense it. And he, he flows in the fruit of the Spirit. What is obvious is his yielding to the Holy Spirit and how it flows through him. And, and most of the points, as I said, tied very tightly to what Pastor Gary had been teaching us. So a month a month or so ago, I've been gone for a month, so maybe a little bit more than that. Pastor Gary mentioned, and, and you know, just a side note for a minute, when Pastor Gary, in my perspective, mentions something from the pulpit that God is telling him to do, and he has the unction to share it with us, it's a good time to take a note. Because the Holy Spirit is working through our man of God to tell us this might be a good idea. So I think it's so neat that the Holy Spirit th spoke through Pastor Gary and told Pastor Gary to start confessing 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8. And we can turn there, please. Uh, Peter Amplified, please, on that one. I like the Amplified because it really, for me, holds me more accountable. It lays out more clearly, <laughs> like some of the, the King James words, I can kind of wiggle around. Does that make any sense? <laughs> Find a little escape path. Oh, that's not really that what they mean. In the Amplified, there's no wiggle room. <laughs> this is what love is. So, so verse 4 says, love endures along. It is patient and kind. Love never is envious, nor boils over with jealousy. Uh, it is not boastful or vainglorious. It does not display itself haughtily. We could just stop at verse 4 and have a bunch of work to do. <laughs> Maybe not you, me. Um, it is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. It is not rude or unmannerly. It does not act unbecomingly. unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own ways. For it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account, none, of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes, is every, ever ready, ever ready, to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. Love never fails. And so as Nikki Gumbel's teaching about love, this, this scripture's jumping up, in our leaders, because he talked about leadership through love. 
And, and so this scripture is jumping up in my spirit. Um, and the Holy Spirit said to me, now, read it again. So Peter, if we can go back to the beginning of that one, uh, on verse 4. Now where you see love, change it to leader. Because if you are a leader, then you should be flowing in love. So leaders, if I can turn my page here, um, leaders endure long. They are patient and kind. Leaders are never envious nor boil over with jealousy. They are not boastful or vainglorious. They do not display themselves haughtily. Leaders are not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. They are not rude, unmannerly, and they do not act unbecomingly. Leaders, through God's love in us, do not insist on their own rights or their own way, for they are not self-seeking. They are not touchy or fretful or resentful. They take no account of the evil done to them, and they pay no attention to a suffered wrong. They do not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but they rejoice when right and truth prevail. Leaders bear up under anything and everything that comes. They are every re ever ready to believe the best of every person. Their hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and they endure everything without weakening. Leaders never fail. Yeah, wow. That is what we're meant to be. And you say, well, I'm not a leader. Are there people around you somewhere in your life? Then you are a leader. See, God's picked you to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So he needs you to lead. He needs you to touch the lives and to share his love with everyone else around you. Right? If you think about a person in your life, maybe before you were a Christian or even in your walk as a Christian, and they, and they, you could just see the manifestation of the love of God in them all the time, or the fruit of the Spirit. You were always drawn to them. There was always something about them that you knew they were going to have a kind word. They would bring in something when you were having a down day, maybe a, a cookie they made or something. You always knew that there was something special about the way they acted. You see, that is leadership. That is the love of God flowing in a tangible way. It's not about titles. That's what I started with. It's not about titles. It's not about offices. It's not about positions. Leadership is about bringing the love of God to every person in your sphere of influence. That's what God has called us to do. And too often we confuse leadership with being a title or being a person. But it's really a call upon all of our lives. Um, can we go to picture number two, please, Peter? Like there was many speakers, and so every one of them there was an impartation and there was, there was something in this discussion of love and leadership that, that was something that touched your heart. Some more than others, some you kind of sit there going, eh, I'm not sure, but you know somebody in 6,000 needed to hear that message, and, and maybe it wasn't your part of it. Um, in particular, um, uh, Cardinal Louis Teglia of the Philippines was really, really touched my heart in terms of how he presented. Oh, it's difficult to see with the light on. Anyway, little tiny man in stature from the Philippines, um, and this man so modeled the love of God and the fruit of the Spirit. Um, he was very humble and very humorous, and it was a great combination. Um, so, he, so one of the questions, Nikki, it was kind of an interview format, and Nikki was asking him some questions about his daily routine and, and what he has done. Um, so he said, well, he said, I, I'm not going to tell you, you know, this is the way to do, this is what I do, is really what he said. Like, this is kind of what I do each day. And he starts each morning, just to give you the scope of his responsibility, there's 82 million Catholics in his responsibility. So it's not a small accountability that he's got. And he, he started out by saying, um, actually, he reminded me a lot of Desi and Pastor Gary and others, I'm sure, but, but you two in particular, because he's very disciplined about time in the spirit and time in the word. So he gets, he gets up every morning early. And if he's got a meeting in the morning, he gets up earlier. 
and he spends time in prayer, meditating the word, and with the Holy Spirit before he starts his day. That's so critical to him. He won't start his day without that. But what he, what he said next is something that's certainly not a, a practice I have done, at least not to, deliberately. This man very clearly demonstrated the fruit of self-control. So at, by lunchtime, by noontime, what he does is he, um, he stops what he's doing and he examines his consciousness. So he puts it on pause. And he stops and he said, what are the feelings, thoughts, and desires in my thoughts and my hearts right now? So he forces himself. You know, we talk about take every thought captive. Pay attention to what you're thinking. Well, he has a discipline to stop at noon and say, what am I thinking? And what's my heart leaning towards? And the question he asked himself, and I said, wow, was will this movement lead me to the fruit of the Spirit or the ways of the world. So he pauses deliberately to say, where am I going and where will that take me? And then he said, I discern how the Spirit is working in me and how the enemy is working in me. And in the second half of the day, I am more diligent to watch for those behaviors that are not going to lead me to the fruit of the Spirit. And he deliberately corrects his path if needed. And then he does it again at night, so he starts fresh in the morning and watches for whatever. So to me, it was a whole other step of taking that thought captive. Too often, we, I, for me, you go into autopilot. Like I left church tonight. I've been gone for three weeks. And so this is the first night I had to pick up the kids at school. And I know to go Main Street. You don't go Portland Street and Culver Road this time of night. Well, autopilot took me. Next thing I know, I'm going down the Cirque to, to Portland Street. I'm like, no, wrong way, wrong way. There's really no place to turn around, so I did Cole Harbor Road. But I went in autopilot. Well, too often in our day, our thoughts are in autopilot. We've talked about this, about doing the dishes at the sink. You can have stupid thoughts doing the dishes. Maybe it's just me. Anybody else? Maybe you shouldn't do dishes. Maybe that's the answer. <laughs> Stop doing dishes. No, all of a sudden, you're doing something, a menial task, right? And all of a sudden, you realize where your thoughts are going. And you're going, whoa, what? And I, I don't mean, you know, I mean, don't think the worst of me, but they're just they're carnal thoughts that don't belong in the mind of Christ. Well, I think it's really cool. So his discipline is to force himself to pause and meditate on what he has been thinking since he woke up the, in, after he did his meditation time and prayer. Anyway, I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just telling you, you can see the fruit of his discipline in his actions. He's, you know, he was asked, what is the one of the things you struggle with as a leader? And he said, well, first of all, I don't consider myself a leader. And he said, I guess if I was to... If I was to say one thing I struggle with, I struggle with being a, a cardinal. He said, and, and it's, it's something God is working on within me. He said, but it was never my plan to be a cardinal in the church. He, he loved Jesus. He wanted to be a priest, but he didn't have a political agenda. He just wanted to serve God. And so, so his challenge is to see himself as a leader that God sees him as. And he was so open in sharing this. 6,000 people are listening to him kind of sharing how, how he's, he's working on that and working on, like he said, I'm grateful to God, and so I'm asking God to help me to, to, to be what he, he sees me to be uh, in this role. And, and he, was, he was so humorous at the same time. So there was a papal visit to, um, to the Philippines, and over 8 million people came. And it was his job to arrange all that. And so he was asked, how do you lead? How did you lead it? And he said, well, I, I didn't really. He said, it just, I prayed a lot. Like the Holy Spirit just, and so there was an example. They needed 5,000 people just to give out communion. And, but he talked about an example. This is the Holy Spirit. Like you can see the Holy Spirit just flowing through this man and, and the innovation and the inspiration. He met with the papal security force because they have their own police team. And, and they, they, their plan was like, you know, side by side like Roman soldiers. Like, and he said, well, why, why are you bringing the Pope? Nobody's going to see him with your plan. 
Like they won't get a viewpoint of it. And then he said, like this is the kind of inspiration. He said, let the people protect the Pope. And so they went to the churches in the Philippines and they asked for volunteers. If 50,000 people, sorry, 50,000 people volunteered to take training with the papal, papal security force and they guarded the roofs. The people protected the Pope. There was not one incident in the whole event. But that's kind of the leader. But, but, but he talks like, because he doesn't take any credit for what God does. So he's kind of like, well, I didn't really lead. <laughs> I just let the Holy Spirit do what God said to do. Um, he smiles a lot and he laughs a lot. And Pastor Gary, you and Pastor Nancy have taught a lot on the importance of laughter. And sometimes we think laughter is carnal, so we dismiss it. But we're so wrong. Yeah. Laughter, laughter is not carnal. Yeah. Matter of fact, he said laughter is an important part of his ministry. He said he can do this as he lives in the spirit. That's why he can laugh, because he operates from a position of the spirit. He said, it is a profession of my faith to laugh a lot. And he said, I can laugh at my own mistakes. And he said, I want, I want you to understand, I take Jesus very seriously. He said, but I take myself and other things very lightly. Yeah, oh yeah. When he was asked about the hardest thing in his job, in addition to receiving you know, the, the mantle that God has put upon him, he said, and, and this really resonated with me, you guys would probably laugh, I mean, he spoke, he said, the challenges of being a problem solver. <laughs> he said, because that's what a leader does, isn't it? We solve problems. He said his, desi his desire was always to help fix the situations. So he was becoming very, very, he was, he was finding a lot of challenge in that until the Holy Spirit gave him revelation because he said, we can fix problems. But he said, dilemmas do not have solutions. He said, and we have to be able to recognize the difference. Dilemmas are problems that don't disappear quickly. So he spoke of a situation where the Pope was in the Philippines and the children on the street were brought to the Pope. And this one young girl spoke in, in, in the Philippine language. And so he, the Pope asked him to translate. And she said to him, she said, how can there be a God when he lets this happen to us? And she was crying and the Pope was crying and everyone was crying. And, and he said, that is a dilemma. He said, now there was an answer given, of course, but he said, that is a dilemma. And in dilemma, you have to try to help people find meaning and hope in the situation that they are in until that situation can be fixed. But it's not a tomorrow thing. And so what's so neat, like this man is being brought in front of major corporations, in front of large businesses to talk to them about how much they are giving to fixing these problems, how much they are giving to change these issues. Um, and, and change the world uh, in what they're doing. But, but, that, but his point was simply, we tell stories to bring them hope. We have to listen as a leader. We have to see the dilemma, not try to brush it off with a quick Band-Aid solution, but to bring the love of God to that situation and then work with God to resolve the dilemma. So very, very, very powerful. Uh, there was all kinds of other speakers that were equally powerful. Uh, there's a movie that's going to be coming out about one of the gentlemen. His name is Jean Varnier. And he spent, he's now in his 90s, I believe. And from 20 to 90, so almost 70 years, he has spent his life ministering to those that are physically and mentally di disabled. So not like as a doctor. He, he, he bought property and he set up places for them to be loved and to be honored. And, and, and there was part of the video, and they showed him, there was a, obviously a very disabled man, um, a young man that, that couldn't move, and, and, and he's, he's hugging this, this young man's head, and he's giving him kisses and saying, you are so beautiful. You are so wonderful. And it's not an act. It's who this man is. It's how the love of God flows through him. Um, so there was many other speakers. You know, another one that was you know, just made you so grateful for, for where we are and um, is a woman that works in Africa with the women that have been bush slaves to the rebels. And, 
and, and you know, trying to reunite them with their community because the community exiles them once they're taken. So they have no place to come back to. And so there was many, many stories of leading through love and what that might look like in many different parts of the world um, throughout the conference. And, and they had some, bi uh, you know, some business speakers. There was one guy there named Simon Sinek. I guess he's a top seller on some kind of book list. But he talked a lot about leadership, but he talked about it in such a way that he didn't give you any wiggle room. <laughs> like he was just, if you're not acting like this, you, like, so some examples, he said, um, he said, there's a need for consistency versus intensity. Often we'll jump in intensely when there's a problem, but if we've been acting consistency, uh, consistently as leaders, we might not have had the problem. Um, he said, uh, leadership is listening, respecting, and helping the whole group move to the vision. There's always pressure, and I know this from my years in, in the corporate world, there is always pressure to take the expedient route. He said it takes courage not to take the expedient route, but to take the time to work it through. He said when we take the expedient route, people are lost in the process. It's quick to cut people. It's quick to lay people off. It's quick to improve that bottom line, if that's what your focus is. Um, he talked about leaders being authentic. And so some of this we have talked about before. They must do what they say. And he said, at every level, we have a choice to lead. And then the Holy Spirit said to me, exchange that with the word love. love. So really, at every level, what he meant by level was not ranking, at every decision point at every crossroad in our life, at every, something that even seems like a small incident, we have a choice to love. It can be delivered if we want to be. Um, again, many more speakers. The last one I'll talk about was Pastor Gray. And I didn't even realize until today till I looked him up what his church is. They just said he comes from Houston, Texas. Well, okay, some church in Houston, Texas, one of the largest churches. When I looked it up today, it's Joel and Victoria's, Victoria Olstein's church is where he is from. And they've got over 50,000 members. So he spoke passionately. Um, if we can go to Matthew 26, 36, please. And he was hilarious. He was very, very funny. He was a, a large man and, and very, funny and he was sweating like crazy and, and uh, anyway he was hilarious but he um, if we go to Matthew 26 36 which is about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and he said you know in the United States we have like the top 10 list like you know the top 10 this and the top 10 that there's always like on, the, on some of those common shows there's this top whatever and he said he said, this passage never makes it to the top 10 list. He said, we know about the agony of Good Friday, and we know about the silence of Saturday, and we know about the glory of Resurrection Sunday. He said, but nobody celebrates Decision Thursday. Wow. He said, there was always a Thursday before a Good Friday. There was always a Thursday before a Good Friday. And so verse 36 says, then, Jesus, then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he said, yonder wasn't very far. He said, but yonder was a distance between law and grace. Yonder was a distance between condemnation and salvation. And then verse 37, he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and, began, and they began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then he said unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, on, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further, and he fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, 
not as I will, but as thou will. This is where it was coming together for him after 33 years of righteous living, after miracles, after everything he had done. This is Decision Thursday. Nevertheless, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. It is in the nevertheless that we lay down our right to figure it out on our own. In the nevertheless, we give God the space to do what he will with this heart and life to build his kingdom. Not my will, but your will be done. If we're to be the feet and hands of Jesus, we have to embrace the nevertheless. And there's, I'm giving you like three minutes of, you know, a 45-minute sermon, but... I never thought of that before because if there was no Thursday, there would not have been a good Friday. That final decision to be obedient because he knew what it was going to be like and what it was going to cost him. I mean, the word, the word said that he, he was, you know, he sweated blood. If you've ever Googled that, which I have, by the way, you truly can sweat blood. It is when your body is at such a point of stress and distress that you can sweat blood. That's the kind of agony he was in in making that decision. And so the question is, are we willing, are we willing really to say nevertheless? In these last days, in this time of the harvest, are we willing to say nevertheless? Not my will, but thy will be done. It was a powerful conference. And I've given you like three of many, many, many speakers. And, and, and there's so much that was imparted that I can't share in words. If we prayed in the spirit for a while, you'd, you'd get it. <laughs> but it's difficult to put in in English. Um, Peter, let's try for the fun of it to see if the video will play. It might go sideways. So don't really try to look at the picture. The point of the video is there is 6,000 people, and Darren and I were together through this the whole time, and he looked at me at the, when this video went out just after I snapped it, and he said, how does everybody know these songs? Because there was such unity in the way everybody was praising and worshiping. It felt like they had all been rehearsing together. And Pastor Paul, Pastor Carlo, you guys could have been on that stage. You were every bit as good as that praise and worship team. No doubt. Matter of fact, I'd like to see you there with the acoustics. It would be amazing. Now, let's try to play it and see, Pete, if you might, the picture might not work. It works great on my phone, but we need a new computer for the sound booth. Or we have kind of a box that kind of looks interesting. Okay, no go on that. Anyway, if you want to hear it after, it's 10 seconds on my phone. It is amazing. I could bring it up, put it on my mic. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. All right. Let me grab it. Because it's worth hearing the unity that was in that place. Give me one second. It is amazing how God can work through so many different people and different faiths and different denominations. All right, let me crank it up. Ready? You can't see it. Trust me, it's awesome. Praise God. 6,000 people, and if you could have seen it, I was panning the audience, and everybody. It didn't matter the denomination. It didn't matter where you came from. It didn't matter the color of your skin. Everybody was worshiping God and loving the presence of God. It was, it was so amazing. Um, one of the breakouts that we had was at one of the Holy Trinity Brompton churches. Peter, if we can go to the next picture. 
And for anybody that's done alpha, oh, you, I wish it was, anyway, you can't really see because it's bright up here, but it's the, it's the sculpture of the prodigal son. And in every alpha course, this sculpture is shown uh, as Nikki talks about the love of Jesus. And you know, if you think about the story of the prodigal son, the father was walking out 1 Corinthians 13. He thought no account of the suffered wrong. He thought the best of his son. He was ever ready to believe the best of his son. Anyway, so I had to show that because everybody alpha wanted to see this picture because I was right up at this statue at Holy Trinity Brompton. Um, after the conference, with the rest of the trip was visiting with family and friends in England and Wales and Norway. Um, there was many, many amazing experiences. I won't show you all my pictures. You'll be here all night. But needless to say, the hand of God was throughout every part of the trip. The favor of God could not do enough for us, went before us. You know, we, we go to customs in any country and they're like, how y'all doing, you know? Or, or hi, hi in Norway or whatever country. You know, they were just, it was just amazing. Um, one of the things, if we can go to the next uh, picture, please. Uh, one of the things we did in Norway is we decided to climb a mountain because everybody should. Um, and the, the mountain is called Prickestone, which means pulpit rock. So that's quite funny that I was climbing the pulpit, um, if they can bring it up. The, the hike up in this, see the, the, the guidelines in Norway, yeah, so that's me approaching it. Um, Darren and I and his brother John. So we'll end up at the top there. You see that little bump at the end of it? That's someone sitting on the end of that rock. They're crazy. I did not go that near to the edge. Um, that's 600 meters down to the, uh, to the fjord down below. But in Norway, the theme is don't be stupid. So there's no guardrails. There barely is any, there was one set of steps, like wooden steps over uh, one, two, three, four, how many kilometers was it? Three, four, five, six kilometers. Um, at this point, see the, the ledge here on the right? It's about from there to here. That's what you walk by to get up there. And uh, the hike, it's, it's rugged like Peggy's Cove. There's a lot of stepping. You sweat like crazy. Um, anyway, at one point, there is about a kilometer and a half of steps. Now, when I say steps, I don't mean something nice like this. I mean jagged, rugged rocks, most of which the gate is two or three steps high. So for my nice long legs, every step was like this. Well, after about a kilometer and a half of that, you're going, hi, hi, hi. Anyway, made it to the top. If we can go to the next picture, there's Darren and I at the top. You can see the view behind. And we had a picnic up there, and it was lovely. There was one crazy guy that thought it was a good idea to do handstands at the edge of the top. We're just looking away like, I'm like, God, if he falls, I can't help him. I'll pray, but I can't help him. He's just going to be so gone. Anyway, it was amazing um, doing this hike. So I thought going up was a lot of work. But you know what inspired me? But there was a family that came down, and it was like a, when we're going up, they're coming down. And so it's a father and mother, a couple kids, and then grandma and grandpa. I thought, OK. If they can make it to the top, <laughs> I can do this trip. What I forgot about was going back down. Because after you've done kilometers of steps and rocks and climbing over things, when you've got to come back down over those same steps, your muscles are starting to go, <sighs> and your quads are starting to kick in, and you're starting to go, why did I do this again? Matter of fact, I was going down the steps for a good part of it. I was going down them like this. And Darren said, why are you doing that? I said, because I can. Because <laughs> that's all I got left. After kilometers of these steps, that's all I've got left. Um, the last picture was really cool. And it just shows you how the presence of God permeated the whole trip. So uh, some of our flights were at night. Some of our flights, it was overcast. This flight from Norway back to London, I could see the shadow of the plane. And so I thought that was kind of cool. So I'm kind of watching the shadow moving along the ground. Nothing exciting. But then God said, grab your phone and take a picture and zoom in. And so if you go, to, you can barely see. Can you see the, you can kind of see the clouds. Let's go to the next picture, please. OK, can you see the shadow of an airplane by the blue arrow? If you could see it, which you really can't too well up there, but you can see it clearly on my phone, there is 
a, a full rainbow right around encapsulating the plane, completely encircling the plane. Nowhere else, just the shadow of the plane I am in moving in a rainbow. That's the goodness of God. And that was our trip, and God is awesome. Praise God. The God we serve, and that's where I started, and Pastor Carlo, it's awesome that you played that song, because that's the God of love. You know, we lead with love because he first loved us. The God that remembers that 20 years ago, I was leading people in Alpha, not knowing squat, and playing mu music on, on discs, and it was wow, 2007 was the blue and yellow disc. Anybody remember them? And that's what that song was on. And God used that song to minister to the first groups in Alpha. God never forgets your acts of love. And so I say that to give you boldness and to stir you up and to, and to ask the Holy Spirit to help you recall the dreams that you've had if you had asked me 20 years ago, would I be in London at a conference with Nikki Gumbel with my husband, enjoying the conference, I would have said, mm, I'm not thinking that's on my list. Would I be a pastor in London at a conference with my husband, having four daughters at home that are old enough to take care of themselves? Like, God's a long-term planner. So we got to be careful not to look at our current situation and allow it to determine where we think we're going to go. God's got plans and thoughts and purposes, his word says, that are far higher than ours. So let's not believe the limits anymore. Let's trust that we have a big God who has a big plan and wants to use each and every one of us to bring it to pass. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise, and praise God. We are done, unless Pastor Gary or Pastor Paul have anything. I mean, I can pray for you. If anybody needs prayer, come on up. I'd be happy to pray for you. If I can impart some of what I picked up at the conference, I'm wel welcome, you know, welcome to lay my hands on you. It was, as everything is, when we give time to God, it is always life-changing. This just happened to be in London. But it is always life-changing.